Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Jared Brandon, Brandon Wound Pickups. Hey, this is Todd Novak. We are super excited that you are listening to our show, The Guitar Knobs Podcast. And uh, gentlemen, what do we do on the show? Anybody, anybody? We talk about cool boutique things and we talk to the the uh unique builders that build the cool boutique things like pick, pickups and uh pedals and guitars and amps and awesome all kinds things. of stuff yeah yeah that's Wires. that's a very good summation of what we do uh any of you who are listening for the very first time uh, we have quite a backlog of fantastic interviews with the builders that you uh, know and love and probably a lot that you don't know but will love <laughs> and so that's a lot of interviews people so go to the guitar knobs.com to check out all those uh interviews and uh listen to us on spotify on itunes wherever you like uh, we'd also like to give a big, ginormous shout out to Tony Road Road, Road Microphones. We're operating our Road Caster Pro, and then uh, and we also have these fantastic Road microphones that they provide us with. So they're taking really good care of us. Please check them out, Road Microphones. We are very grateful for their help, gentlemen. I think. I'm pretty sure we have somebody extremely special on the line. Like, this is a big one. This is a big one. <laughs> All right. Oh, how you doing? Yeah, I'm Rick Kelly. I build guitars here at Carmine Street Guitars. We make uh, musical instruments, mostly electric guitars out of reclaimed New York City timbers. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, this is uh, this is one we've been really looking forward to. I was thrilled to uh, get the information that uh, we were going to be able to to have you on the show. It's going to be very exciting. We're going to learn a lot about your history as a as a luthier and your shop, a historic shop, and uh, all of the lore that uh, is surrounding that. First, we're going to just check in with ourselves <laughs> and find out what have we been doing in our guitar worlds this week uh tony ah i see well this week uh i think last time we talked about some very special rogan knobs that i had ordered on on ebay and they Mm. finally came in and they're they're very cool they're actually very similar to the ones that that rickenbacker used in the 50s uh and these are just it but i mean they're a little slightly different shape but they're the same size so i've got a project coming up that is going to be just perfect for these awesome and Jared, how about you? Uh, the Digitech PDS seventeen hundred pedal that I bought a few weeks ago. Got to uh, experiment with it, play through it, and all that kind of thing. It's everything I wanted it to be and more. It's it's just a fantastic pedal. It's got lots of buttons, bells and whistles, and um, I'm really happy with it. So it was just a follow up. That's excellent. Yeah. I like that. Hey, uh, Rick, how about yourself? Anything new in your guitar world this week? Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, I just find occasionally I'll get a different tool or a piece of sandpaper I particularly like using, and uh, <laughs> we did <laughs> that works. Yeah, 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 that works. So, so, yeah, but it, it doesn't work too well. I'm not too happy with it. I like the old fashioned stuff. Yeah. Do you have particular scraps that you grow fond of, or is this a is it a brand thing or? Well, it's mostly, uh, I use a lot of scraper, you know, I use an uh, actual um, a scraper that you have to burnish and create the cutting edge on it. Uh-huh. And so I've never been a big fan of sandpaper, but um, it, it comes in handy in a lot of places. And sometimes you have to resort to sandpaper. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, well, in my music world this week, I am about to, I just had to go get a bunch of new strings because I got to gig coming up this saturday and i i it's it's time i gotta restring the ladies the ladies <laughs> yeah put some put some new stockings on the ladies <laughs> um so uh, that's always a really fun thing for me because i can just kind of zone out down in the basement and and uh just have some time so what is your technique if i if i can if i can ask uh my technique to restringing yes well, uh, I'll see if you're doing it right. Do you have a crank? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I do have a crank. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, wh- I, what exactly are you asking? Uh, when you're putting the strings on. Well, yeah. Well, how, uh, let's start. Uh, what, uh, how, uh, do you do one? Uh, okay. Here's what I like. To All do. right. Here we go. I like sure. to do one over 
and the rest under. Yes, I do that. Okay, one over, the rest yes. under. Perfect. You're doing the, the it only, right. The only time I don't do that is on my... Uh, oh, on a Gibbs or the... Uh, no, on my, on my Fender. Oh, yeah, because it's got a safety it's got post. The, it's got the hole. Yeah, you got to yeah. put the thing in the thing. Got to put the thing in the thing. Okay, good. I thought I, I was going to nail you. Yeah, and I use wrong. SIT strings, so they, they get... They, Akron, Ohio. What they do, what I like... One thing that I like about what they do is that they've figured out like, hey, if, if you take all these strings off and you then you, you can actually do the correct or maybe not correct, but at least build u- semi uniform tensions as you're putting them in based on how they re- how they package the strings. I mean, that's pretty smart, hmm. you know, so they do like uh, uh, six and two and then five and one and three or I can't remember the numbers, but you know what I mean? Yes. Um, on, on either side, uh, they use three envelopes instead of six. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but they, but, but I always end up with, I got piles of extra strings because <laughs> they, they always put the extra oh, strings. Oh, that's there. right. They do put yeah. extras. That's a lot of content for string changing. I know. <laughs> Rick, what, do you have a string of choice? Oh, uh, I, I, I use all different kinds, probably more Diderios than anything, just because they're right here in Farmingdale, right across the river and they're very fresh. Nice. So we use a lot of Diderios and I, I think they make SIT strings, which I like too. I use a lot of SITs and GHS and Rota sounds that I just started using recently, but we do probably a thousand string changes a month here. And, uh, it is hilarious to see people when they come in with their guitars and they've actually tried to put the whole string without cutting it at all and it'll actually <laughs> break the tuner <laughs> i've actually seen everything you wouldn't believe how many string uh things you've seen over the years i i can only imagine mm-hmm. um now when when you tear open a new pack do you do you is it like coffee do you stick your nose in and go Ah, ah, fresh strings. These are made on Tuesday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sealed for freshness. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Funny. Um, cool. Well, that's a quick little wrap up. Um, so l- let me uh, let me explain for the listeners here real quick here. Um, Rick has a new movie out, and he's he's not only a storied luthier, but now he's a big movie star. Ah. Oh my God. <laughs> 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's a, it is a, it is a, if you love guitars, it is a glorious hour and some change of, of fame. So, uh, we, um, we've got a lot of questions to, we want to learn as much as we can about you. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about this film that came out. And just for those who um, are, can follow along right now and find out, you know, a little bit more about you, uh, provided you're not driving, which we always say, uh, <laughs> uh, where can people go to check out your work, Rick? Oh, well, it's all right here at Carmine Street Guitars. We don't uh, make guitars for any other stores, really. Occasionally, you'll find a, a used one on Reverb or one of the other stores may have one, but it's almost all custom and I'm um, usually about a year back ordered. So I try to make one or two each month for the store and make it available at a slightly higher price. But normally it's about a year wait. Wow. That's a good problem yeah. to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Carmine Street Guitars, and I, th- I believe that is at um, kellyguitars.com. So if, yeah. if, you, uh, if you're at your phone or your, your computer, you uh, want to go over to kellyguitars.com, check out what he is building. Yeah, we got a lot of Instagram photos, too, at Carmine Street Guitars, and that's pretty much every day we post something that's going on here each day and some new guitar we just finished. That's can you what, how, how about tell us about one that you just finished uh yeah we just made one uh for the uh producer of the movie ron man he's the uh movie director and in, in uh, originator and uh cindy actually made it for him and it's made from multiple pieces of wood ron has a table in his apartment that's made you know, like butcher block style sort of but a little different and cindy actually pieced together all these different pieces of of pine and made the grains match up, but they're all in different directions. And then I used to make a lot of guitars that had stripes, kind of like an old cutting board. And we use that for the back of it. So it's a, it's a really unique guitar and I uh, hope he's happy with it, but uh, he'll get presented it on Wednesday when we have the, the film for the first film for him. Oh man, that's, that's super exciting. So the, the launch of the film is next Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday is uh, the, it's a sold out premiere, and then I think uh, Saturday is still available. And there's a couple of Q and A days where we do a Q and A after the movie's over. 
Mm-hmm. Where's where's the premiere going to be? The Film Forum, right here in New York City. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's uh, right around the corner from the shop, actually. So you could always come a little early and check out the shop and go over and see the movie. So that'll be April twenty fourth. This is going to launch uh, just past that i think um mm. but uh even so people can still go check out the movie um and i'm sure there's going to be listings around the country of where you know yeah. you can find that yeah. um so uh, you mentioned uh, cindy we're going to find out a little bit more about her um but i want to uh, you know for those who are not familiar with this little magic shop of yours, um, we'd like to get a little bit of a backstory. I don't think we're going to give away anything within the movie. The movie is really, I, I was telling Tony, you know, we, we were kind of talking about it and, and it felt like a day in the life, just several days in the life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's based on five days and uh, the shop and who comes in and hangs out. And it is kind of that way. The store is really open and a lot of the guitar players like to come in sometimes just on a lunch break and sit and play something. And there's a lot of guitars that you can just grab and sit and play a little bit. And it's always, it's always fun when somebody comes in with their girlfriend and they sing them a love song and stuff like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I get a kick of out of that. Yeah. yeah, I get a real kick out of that. Yeah, until their wife shows up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. yeah. So um, you, th- that shop's been there an awful long time. When did you first uh, set up? Well, I was around the corner back in 1975 on Downing Street, which is just around the corner from where I am now. I've been in this shop for uh, about 30 years now. And wow. uh, yeah, Carmine Street Guitars, 30 years. We just I just celebrated 50 years of guitar making. I started in 1968. Wow. And, and what what exactly was that little tick that you got that made you say, I need to do this thing? This, yeah. yeah, it was that first one. You know, I just uh, made a little ukulele in art class in high school, and that was the first one I made. And I just got this thing about it. It just it made music, and it was something I could make. And I just always wanted to be a sculptor or something that I could make things that would last, outlive me, and that would be around long after I was gone. And I love the idea of making musical instruments because they fit that bill. They are going to be around for much longer than you'll be alive, and they'll pass on, and they have their own life. After they leave you or Prevure, they go on to live a new life. And it's uh, it's always been fascinating to me that that happens. I love that sentiment, and even more so when it's a boutique builder when when it's got someone's actual fingerprint on it who crafted it from you know top to bottom and uh, yeah. thought about every little detail for someone special. That's the reason why we do the show. We seek those people out, and because we know that that stuff's important to us. So you started with the ukulele, and then uh, you what was was it just right into building uh yeah actually i was in college at uh, in the early 70s and i was trying to pay help pay my tuition which was a private art school it was pretty expensive it was down to baltimore city it was called merrill institute college of art and uh, it's you know at the time i had very little finances so it was kind of on my own a friend of mine from uh, down south and he came back with an appalachian dulcimer and it looked like an instrument i could actually make and sell so I started making those and during jury, jury craft fairs in the early, early 70s. And I made my living actually doing that. And then uh, at the same time, I was actually building guitars as well. So I started right away with solid body guitars in about 1970. And um, that just, uh, you know, always fascinated me. There was Telecaster players down there when I was down in, in uh, Baltimore that were pretty famous. Uh, Penny Callis, Dimitri Callis, his name was, he was you know, kind of like a Roy Buchanan who was also down there at the time and uh, Danny Gatton. They were all famous guitar players from that same area, Washington, D.C. area Mm. in Baltimore. And uh, I was really impressed so much with their playing styles that it it became the guitar of choice for me. But even as a kid, I used to walk down 48th Street here in New York City when it used to be the guitar block. Uh, It would walk me down the block and I would see all these old 50 Telecasters in the windows with that blackguard blonde and, and it's the look of it just stuck with me forever and when i started building guitars that was the one i wanted to make hmm. that there is something awfully special even when we go to the guitar shows uh you know if you see if you see that old uh blackguard oh boy there's just nothing it's 
it's hard to explain. There just isn't mm-hmm. anything like that. Yeah, it just stays with you. Uh, were there any major influences early on uh, as far as your, um, I guess, your the, the music styles or uh, builders that were influencing you beyond the Telecaster? Um, yeah, I mean, Paul Reed Smith was starting to build right around the same time I did, and he was in Annapolis, Maryland, and I was really impressed with his very first instruments that were made of one big chunk of mahogany. And I don't know how many of those he made. There was probably very few, but uh, I always thought that was a great, you know, idea to incorporate it as one. And then I wound up finding an old Supro, and that was made in a similar fashion, where the neck and the half the body were made from the same piece. And then uh, there was a guy named S. D. Curley. I don't know if you ever been familiar with those guitars. Yeah, I remember. But that. Uh, he had a, like kind of a half a neck through. It went down three quarters into the body. Uh, by then, by the eighties, there was a lot of neck through guitars and no Rickenbackers were set necks and Gibson's had set necks. And there were so many different styles of construction that I was impressed by all of them and always you know, were influenced by them. But there was something about the bolt on neck Telecaster and the guys who played him. I was a really big Roy Buchanan fan back then. And I remember when Roy came out with his snake stretchers album and he was actually walking the streets of DC and they had to burlap cover on them. And he was giving them away and was actually had a job teaching, uh, in at the Smithsonian back in their seventies. I was way too young to have this great job of teaching, <laughs> uh, guitar making, but I used to go down with a rented car. And after I'd go into Georgetown and, and I'd get to see Roy, you know, just from the sidewalk looking in and the doors were open and I could see him playing, but it was really impressive. Before that, I was actually used to come into the Greenwich Village and I got to see Jimi Hendrix in 1965 playing at the bitter end. And uh, that was another moving moment for me to see that old rubbery wrist of his. And I couldn't couldn't believe how he could get that sound out of that thing playing behind his head. Uh, Uh, That that was another thing that got me. And I mean, you just get hooked. You just don't want to do anything else with your life except be a guitar player and a guitar maker. Now, you started building the guitars that you were coming up with your own shapes and stuff, as well as uh, the Telecaster, which I know is kind of brought up in the movie. But along the way, you kind of landed on something extra special, which is the Bowery Wood. Could you tell us a story about that? Yeah, this would, um, you know, I got the first uh, pine from a friend of mine, actually, way back in the, uh, when I first opened the shop in the early 90s. I mean, I've always used reclaimed wood for you know, when I was back in art school, even because I just didn't have any money. But then when I, you know, realized that, you know, old instruments sound better for a reason as they get older. And, uh, and I think it had a lot to do with it at the time of the wood. It also has to do with the vibrations in the wood. But um, when I first got some pine from a friend of mine from Virginia in a house he grew up in, it was his, it was his grandfather made the house and he had some like tables uh, that were made from pine and, he gave me some pieces that were one growth and they sounded really good, but it wasn't until about five years later that uh, Jim Jarmish uh, filmmaker was doing his roof uh, over on the building that he lives on over down on the Bowery. And uh, that wood was the, the pine that now I use can, you know, all the time. And it was uh, this old white pine that I found out later that the whole city is actually built from this wood that all these buildings, uh, you know, are the bones, I call it the bones of old New York because this, all these old buildings from the 1800s are constructed of this old pine astrobus. It's a white pine species. And the trees were like 300 years old. They were huge. There was nothing here but Indians and trees. And they built all the city out of this wood. And now the wood has been indoors for 170 years. So I said, oh, this stuff is like gold. This is going to be great. And then when I heard the first ones, I actually made the neck out of the same wood of the body, changed everything. When the neck and the body were made from the same wood, and it was this old growth with really tight grain structure, and I cut it on the quarter for the necks, and they were just so stable. But the guitars had this really warm tone because of the wood, and the uh, age of the wood, that it was indoors for all this time, that a certain kind of alchemy happens when the wood is up near the roof, and uh, hot and cold cycles, you know, it gets over 120 degrees on this. Right. We call it tar beach here up on the roof. There's a black tar on all these old buildings. 
and it just cooks the wood even more. And it's all, they're all blackened. They have this beautiful patina on them with this blackened color, which I try to keep in the wood a lot of times. That was actually Lenny Kay. He ordered a guitar from me, and he wanted it to just look exactly like the patina on the wood. So he was the first one to, to get one that I kept the patina as much as I could on the wood. Um, but yeah, I can't say enough great things about this wood. It's, it's old growth. It's 60, 70 years, and it's just super resonant. And, uh, you know, it's the same wood they use on soundboards for instruments, musical instruments. For 5,000 years, they've been making instruments with pine and spruce as the tops. Even Stradivarius' violins had pine tops, not spruce. Really? I yeah, did not that know was that. something I learned after reading the Stradivarius book about 10, 20 years ago. I, I realized it was a species of balsam pine that from Cremona that no longer grows, but that's actually what he used for his tops. Wow. Well, I learned a little bit about the violin today. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, I was at, when I was at your shop five or six years ago, three things that really impressed me. One, <laughs> the size of your shop is, I would say, is relatively small. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe yeah. not by New York standards, New York but, by, standards. <laughs> but, but yeah. by industry standards, it's small. And yes. it's amazing that you can churn out what you do. Uh, yeah. The second thing was that you knew where every piece of lumber came from. I know you have it marked, but you, know, you would say, oh, yeah, that one came from here. Here, that one came from that building blah, blah, blah. Yeah. and then the third thing was the big the big uh, box of nails that you the wire cut nails yeah. that you had yeah. <laughs> laying yeah. next to your bench uh -huh. <laughs> that was really nice yeah the thing with this wood is it's um you know that's why we don't worry too much about factories copying this idea but this uh wood is filled with cut nails and you know it's just roof rafters and floor joists so you have to accommodate and we've got this beautiful old nail puller from the 1800s that I used to pull the nails. But, um, you know, that's it's well worth it. You know, the wood is just pretty much like gold to me. It's so special. I would assume that at this point in time in your career, uh, especially with your reputation, that you probably get quite a few calls where I would assume that it would be almost an honor to be able to provide you with that wood because they know that that wood's going to be something really special. Yeah, the other thing too I really enjoy is when people have frequented a certain building that I have wood from and they want their guitar to be made from that wood because they had their honeymoon there for whatever reason. Bob <laughs> Dylan actually has a guitar that was wood from Chumley's because he used to hang out at Chumley's and and he wanted to know if the beer that was sp that he spilled on the floor was in his guitar. <laughs> of course, I said, of course it is. Of course, <laughs> of course the it answer is. is yes. you know? yeah. <laughs> but that was a uh, that and McSorley's too. I've cut. You know, I got it made. The movie actually has me making a guitar from McSorley's. It was always a place because I go there every Sunday at one o'clock and have a couple of beers and leave. And it was always some place I really wanted to get. It's the oldest bar in New York. It's grandfathered in wood stove that burns all winter long and sawdust on the floors and memorabilia all around it. Uh, just, it's just covered in dust. And it's, it reminds me of the shop. It reminds me, always wanted to build a guitar with wood from that building. And they, uh, they did a New York times article about the shop one time and uh, Pepe, the bartender that had read the article and actually supplied me with some wood when he, he found that, uh, I wanted to use wood from mix early. So we incorporated that in the movie. Nice. And on your, uh, your construction method, I think you're, you, it seems to me you do a lot more handwork than a lot of places do. Uh, yeah. It has, has a lot to do with the size of the shop as well. Like you say, there's most guitar makers today. And even a lot of guys that I know that make guitars are all switching over to, to computerized tooling, CAD cam and mm -hmm. CNC, you know, they use CNC for, even small CNCs now are becoming smaller and smaller and more and more affordable for small makers. And I see a lot of advantage in that, but I also see the romantic side that I just love the wood and cutting it by hand. And I love making the necks with a draw knife and spoke shaves and mm. rasps. And, and you can tailor a neck to a person's hand better that way than you can with a program on a computer. And uh, I think there's still a lot to be said for, those little shops in in Spain where they build guitars on dirt, they're still like, you know, in a, a couple of apprentices, a journeyman and the master builder. That was always very romantic to me in a style of building that I always wanted to do. Cool. What, what's your take on truss rods? 
And then well, truss rods are necessary in maple. Maple and pine are two different kinds of trees. You know, the maple trees, or even though it's a harder wood, it actually has to be a malleable cellular structure in the wood so the tree can bend to get through the canopy to get to the sunlight. Whereas pine trees are conically shaped and they grow uh, perfectly straight. And that's the way the wood wants to stay. It works perfectly. If you cut that wood on a quarter, and it's like if you piled up a lot of pieces of metal and tried to bend them in one direction, they're very easy. But if you hold them on their edge, you cannot bend them at all. And that's kind of the way quarter sawn uh, leaves a, a pine neck. It leaves it very straight and it just wants to stay that way. And what happens when you do that is the D string and the G string seem to come a little more alive and they became a little more blended with the other strings because there's no channel or a metal rod underneath those two strings like there would be on most guitars that have truss rods. So I found there was a, definitely an advantage in tone to not using it. And uh, I've you know made them with even pretty heavy strings. And I actually, G. Smith has one of my bases that I made them with no truss rod, believe it or not. Wow. And, and that, <laughs> and that's that, amazing, that, man. Yeah, that guitar, that guitar has been played with Pink Floyd, uh, you know, in the blue, I don't know what they call the, the tour, Roger Waters tour, I guess. He just brought it to Sag Harbor. We had a, a premiere of the film out there, a one day screening, and he brought the bass and the guitar. And they're going on, oh, 15 years old now, and wow. that thing has not moved wow. a lick. That's, that's pretty thing, amazing. So. I didn't know that. You, you described that beautifully. And all I could think about in my head was like a leaf spring from a truck and yeah. how they, they all flex and bow. But if yes. you did turn them on the sun, there's, Aside, there's no they're way not you can move. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly the principle. The leaf spring is a perfect example. Even though it's bent in an arch, if you were to straighten that out and put it on its side, you would never flex it. It would be as stiff as a board. In pine, if you look at the way the grain is, the hard grain in pine, you know, they, they are actually annual rings. You have the winter and the summer. In the winter, when the tree is dormant, that wood is actually harder than a maple. You know, I've tried to make uh, necks without truss rods in 1950, and he actually has photos of him standing on a neck between two chairs and bouncing up and down and saying, this does not need it. <laughs> but, uh, and I actually have made a couple of necks at Maple, Quarter Sawn, and they've stayed pretty straight, but they just tend to want to bend a little bit because of the malleable nature of the cells in the wood. Yeah. Mm. That, that's almost like a samurai sword uh, with, the hard, with the, the hard and the soft, the yes. hard and the soft, too. Yeah, yeah. Kind of neat. Mm -hmm. uh, so you obviously have a deep connection with the necks, but, um, like, can, can you tell us aside from the actual wood, like the neck, we talk about this a lot on the show. The neck is really the life of the, the guitar. Yeah, and yeah. Tell us a, a little bit about your take on the neck. Yeah. I think the neck has way more to do with sound than it's ever been credited for. And the fact that necks kept getting smaller and smaller and skinnier was really a result of three guitar company and going up against each other and, and making their necks smaller and saying our necks are faster than your necks and we kept making them smaller and smaller and then all these guitar players were getting tendonitis and carpal tunnel and they're pinching to make chords on the neck and you know uh we have a couple of hand surgeons here in the city that play guitar and, and their prescription for you know correcting that is to go to a guitar with a bigger neck and it actually works. It's a proven thing that bigger necks are actually easier to play because it relaxes your hand. It fills your hand instead of you squeezing and pinching and creating tension in your wrist and your elbows. It actually makes, you know, think of classical guitars. They're almost two inches wide and a full inch thick. They're really pretty massive. And the, the guitar design has never changed for 200 years. It's been the same. Those necks are, are still and they hold up forever without truss rods. They never have truss rods either. Um, of course, they have nylon strings. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, guitars like the old uh, Banner J45 is what I used as a model to make my necks. They are now probably the most revered of acoustic guitars to try to find a Banner J45. You're going to pay top dollar. And during the war era, they didn't have metal to make truss rods. So they were making these big, massive necks on their guitars. And now they're so collectible because they play so well and they sound so great. And you use that for the electrics too, that profile? Yeah, well, that was kind of where the idea came with. I, uh, I have a lot of different profiles. I tend to put a little more shoulder in my necks. And I think a lot of players really 
kind of prefer that once you start playing one of my necks, you're going to wind up selling a lot of your guitars. So you get used to these necks. You don't want to go back to those skinny necks. And it happens all the time. I see it happen time and time again, where the players will go, Oh, I got to get another one of these. I can't play those guitars anymore. So uh, what is your favorite part of the build process? Uh, of course, it's always putting the finish on the wood, you know, to see the wood jump alive and the, the tonal uh, glow of the wood changes color. It's probably still my favorite. That and putting the strings on. There's nothing like hearing the first sound. Each guitar, you just created something from just a, a roof rafter, and now it's a musical mm-hmm. instrument. You know it's going to live, and, and, and it's going to have a home with a, a hopefully a, a really good musician who will be inspired by it. Uh, to me, that's the inspiration I get for continually building them this way. And for that reason, to see people like Bill Frizzell play my guitar and mm-hmm. make such beautiful sounds coming out of it is just magic. I wanted to make a comment on something we were discussing earlier. is the fact that I am also a true believer of the wood that is used to make a guitar totally matters. Cause I had a, um, a vintage uh, Gibson SG-62 and it haunts me from getting rid of it because it's the best sounding guitar, the electric guitar I've ever played in my life. It just, it resonated for days. And yeah. I just dreamt about it the other night. But I wish there was a way we could convey this to the world because I think there's a lot of players out there, you know, that just don't understand or get that and are missing out. Yeah, no, it's true. I think, uh, I remember when people would come into my store and ask if the guitars were made of plastic because they had this heavy, shiny finish on them. And when Fender went from nitrocellulose lacquer to urethane, because the guitars became more and more plastic looking. And it also, you know, I understand where Leo Fender actually went from pine to ash because he wanted to use car colors in the 1950s. Those old Cadillac and Thunderbird colors were um, today, you know, there's a lot more uh, idea of going back to different kinds of finishes that are very thin oil finishes and shellac finishes. And they do make the guitar come more alive. It does have an effect on the tone. And, uh, you know, making guitars, you want to make them sound the best. You don't want to care about the way they look so much. What what uh, what is your favorite finish to use, or what what's your most common finish? I guess shellac. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big shellac fan. I just tried some uh, some of the new uh, Royal Lac that you know, Luthiers Mercantile sells, and uh, I like it. Stinks real bad, but you know I've always just been. <laughs> it's it, it, all those it's, ground up insects. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the old lac bug. Yeah, we had a little problem with the lac bug a few years ago, and I got awful worried, and I was telling one of my friends that works in the hardware store down here about the lac bug and how prices were going to go up on lacquer. And the next day he comes in with four gallons of lacquer and donated them to oh, the wow. store. Oh, wow. Nice. Uh, so, uh, that, was, uh, that was a funny moment. But yeah, the Royal Lac I just started using. It's very thin. It was really meant for French polishes. Mm. Uh, and it's pretty nice and it's convenient. But I've actually, you know, used shellac flakes, really good quality shellac flakes, and you dissolve them and yourself, and, and that, that's a beautiful finish as well. But uh, I, I'm still a fan of old Zisner. Good old Zisner. <laughs> it works pretty well. But it's waxed. It's not de-waxed. It's waxed. And uh, it's, you don't want to put it on on a wet day. You have to have a nice dry day to put it on or it stays kind of sticky. Mm. Rick, in, in the movie, there, I think maybe the, the quote that stuck out for me, and you didn't have a lot of quotes because you're, you're a relatively <laughs> soft-spoken guy, yeah. but uh, the one that when I, when I heard it really resonated with me, and uh, it says, um, the guitar becomes the player. Tell us a little bit about your, your thought on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when a guitarist really finds a guitar like we were just talking about before that you have a certain guitar that really sounds good and you just want to, and it roar, it really feels good and it really plays good. I think the, uh, the, the, the player actually will become sort of part of the instrument and the instrument responds to, to that. I'm always fascinated with, uh, street singers that come in with really cheap guitars and they sound so big and alive and I contribute it to the fact that the vibrations that they play into this instrument every day, they hammer on these guitars, and it does have a molecular effect. I call it the mystery of the molecules, where it actually affects the molecules in the wood. Um, I know there's a little story I always tell about Segovia's Hauser in the Metropolitan Museum of Art here, 
they actually let the people in the Philharmonic play the guitar because it needs to be vibrating. It needs mm. to stay alive and keep vibrating. And they also say that they on it, it's loud and vibrant, but if you tried to say play folk music on it or something, it'll sound sort of dead and unresponsive. And so that is part of that mystery where the instrument does become the player becomes the instrument. It's it really does happen. It's magic, and it's uh, it's kind of indescribable why that happens. Yeah, I've I've heard that you know, a lot of people say that uh, a guitar that isn't played starts to think it's a piece of furniture. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a great one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, Rick, I would imagine that for someone who's putting in as much time as you do uh, for so many years, there's probably a few instances where you, where you are seeing that like literally happen at the moment spontaneously you mean uh when the instrument is finished what happens when, spontaneously? when it's finished and and someone picks up like the one and and you oh, yeah, see yeah. that connection happen jamie hens from the kills is you know he had a, a he slammed his hand in a in a car door and he really thought he was never going to play guitar again and he learned to play and it's funny looking at him playing because he's, he's his middle finger sticks up while he's playing <laughs> but uh he's actually adapted his playing style and um, he had, you know, he was playing this skinny neck guitar that I had made and he was doing fine on it. And then, you know, he was talking, telling me about his injury. And I said, well, have you ever tried to play a guitar with a bigger neck on? It? And so I handed him one that I had just finished. And it was sort of like a semi hollow Telecaster style. And um, he played it and it just came alive in his hands. And I, I swear he said he wanted to run out the door with that guitar. He didn't <laughs> want to give it back. So, yeah, that definitely happens, you know, where it's a magic moment where you see somebody just, uh, even in, in the movie when, when Charlie Sexton in the end and he hits a chord and he goes, wow, you know, he didn't expect it to have this overtone mm -hmm. in a certain part of the neck that just kind of happened. And uh, it is magic when you see that happen for sure. Yeah, somebody that plays so dynamic uh, like the Kills is like the, it, 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 you're not playing like songs. He's playing yeah. sounds, which is a which is kind of a different way to think about it, right? Yeah, and for sure. So, so to have something like resonate and react to what you're doing, not just not just playing the song is uh, I think requires a, uh, well, it certainly requires a different type of playing, but certainly obviously a, a different kind of instrument too. Yeah. It'll affect your playing. Yeah, I think the instrument, you know, and as you say, when it becomes a part of you, you see that happen sometimes with old vintage guitars, you know, you'll see somebody will buy a guitar and they'll come in the next day and they'll say, you know, this guitar just taught me three new songs that I never <laughs> knew I could play. Yeah. And, and I think wow. it, that's a magical thing that really does happen. And it's weird, and it seems like that's unfathomable, but I think it actually works. I think that does happen. It, they it, do have a spirit, and they live on. It absolutely does. We have uh, we have one in our studio. Uh, Tony put together, and it was it's a, you know it's a parts caster kind of a thing, mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. a, a jazz jazz body with Telecaster guts and stuff. And he said, "Hey, I made mm -hmm. this guitar. Why don't you give it a try?" And I took it home, and no joke within five ten minutes i had two brand new songs and i said holy uh, moly oh. i, I got to have one of these and i still haven't seen any yeah. of the royalties yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i yeah. went and built one exactly like it i'm like i wanted the exact same parts uh, so now i have one called uh, one-eyed vinny and uh no, yeah. see, you gave it a name even. That's how personal it is. <laughs> yeah, to you. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you, you know, you've mentioned uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few folks that have been in the shop. As long as you have been building for so many great players, there's got to be one or two that maybe wished that you had the opportunity to build for, but maybe you know, through time, probably don't have that opportunity anymore. Do you have a couple like that? Yeah, but actually I did wind up building for him. I think Robert Quine, you know, he was one of my best friends and he used to come to the store every day, almost after his wife died, he was really depressed and he was kind of given up on music and guitar playing. He had pretty much played, you know, throughout Lou Reed's Blue A Mask uh, era and he played with the Voidoids, who was one of the first Void. Uh, a great guitar player with incredible influences from the spectrum, full spectrum of, of players and was like a historian when it came to uh, guitars and, and who played what and when. And 
in 50s music. And Bob was just a really special guy. And, uh, you know, he wound up, I used to give him the guitar after I finished each one just to test it here in the shop. Mm. That was his job here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he would just go, oh, yeah, this is a good one. This one's magic. Yeah, I'll tell, you know, I think you should keep this one or something like that. You know, that was, he was, he was a special kind of guy. And then, you know, he played with Lou, but they, they didn't speak for many, many years. And uh, because of me, somehow, I think they actually wound up back talking to each other and reconnecting. And uh, Bob actually came out with the hidden tapes where he actually used to go to see the Velvet Underground in the 1960s with the actual reel-to-reel on his shoulder. And he put these tapes out, uh, I guess, probably 15 years ago. And they're called the coin tapes. And they're actually Lou Reed's Velvet Underground before they were the Velvet Underground. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then when I got to know Lou and build Lou guitars, that was also a very magic time. And that started in the early 70s. I uh, was actually working for Lou, building guitars and fixing his guitars. when I was uh, had the shop on Downing Street. There, there's a really interesting part in the movie. There was a, uh, a guitar that was tuned to all the same string. And the oh, story yes. about yes. Lou Reed. So, did yeah. Talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, that's uh, Stuart Herwood. That's uh, Lou's was Lou's guitar tech, and actually, that's what got Lou back into my guitars. He had kind of strayed for a while, thinking that the necks were too big. But uh, Stuart actually had bought one of my guitars, one of the old pine ones, and he thought it was pretty magical. And, and Lou got to play in a little bit, and he was still, he was a very ornery cuss, you know, he, <laughs> he, he just wouldn't accept that, you That's know, awesome. until uh, Aaron Bajakum tried out to get in Lou's band, and he came in with a Kelly guitar and auditioned, and it just, he just made that thing sing. And Lou said, all right, all right, you're in the band. And then well, the next day I got a call and he had to have two of the Bowery Pines. So, I, you know, that was pretty magical seeing them come back. In the movie, you see a scene where two guitars, I think there was actually three guitars that I had made for Lou. And he lays them out on the floor and we took a couple of shots of them. And mm. yeah, Stewart's actually been doing these drone um, e exhibitions now where he takes Lou's guitars and puts them sort of in a semicircle. And get some to all oh, feedback. Oh yes, I heard about this. Yeah, it's a ma it's a magical thing that he gets them to actually balance, standing up on their their tail ends, and and they just they just vibrate towards each other and somehow hold themselves up. That wow. is so incredible. It's, it's spooky. Yeah. <laughs> it's very spooky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and in that scene, he's like this this one guitar is tuned to all the same yeah. note. I never had seen that before or that heard of incredible. that. And I didn't even know he did it. Right. It was just a whole nother way of looking at the guitar. It blew my mind. And that was the first time I ever had heard that. Yeah. I never saw Lou do that, but evidently Lou did do that. It's, you know, Quine used to always say Lou had the Martian ears. He could hear if something was a little out of tune and he would give you hell about it, you know, until you tuned it to way he heard it. Mm. And he was usually right. He had that kind of year where he could hear if things were a little off. Wow. That's, uh, that's pretty special. He was kinda, yeah. He kind of reminded me of Miles Davis, how he used to give his musicians so much shit. Of their, uh, excuse me. I no, had no. to really be in, <laughs> had the right beat and then be in tune. And Lou was a lot that way. He was very much that way. A lot better guitarist and musician he ever, that he ever got credit for. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, I don't think that people would necessarily associate the idea of being like not having Martian ears with the, the type of music that he put yeah. out because he was so um, raw and yeah. and honest and, and almost almost clumsy in some certain mm -hmm. ways in, in right. a beautiful way. Yes, that's yeah. musicians for you. You know, that seems to happen time and time again uh, where you, you see a musician that you know, you, you, you don't associate them as being the uh, Steve I or the Eddie Van Halen or the, you know, a great the technical player. But uh, they have this other side to them where the purity and the soul that they can get out of the instrument is just, uh, you know, it's so different. And so it's better. Yeah. You've been in that shop, like we, we mentioned, quite a few years, and you've got a couple people in there that have also been in there quite a few years. Number one, your mother... Yes. In the shop. <laughs> yeah. How Dorothy, long has she uh, been there? Yeah, man. She's 93 now going on. She'll Whoa. be 94 on uh, That's great. the end of the month here. Yeah. She's her birthday is the 29th. 
and she does all the books and keeps the place clean and dusts all the guitars and <laughs> yells at me still, you know, okay, mom, all right, you know. Does she make she you lunch? To, yeah, no, she doesn't make us lunch, that's for sure. In fact, I have to buy her soup or whatever she wants. But uh, that's all she gets. She doesn't get a paycheck. So she does it for out of love and wow. being able to do something at her age, you know, that's it's so great. Special. That's super yeah. special. And, and then uh, you and, have your assistant, uh, Cindy. Yeah, Tell Cindy. Cindy's a... Yeah, Cindy walked in one day, I guess, seven years ago, and I told all about guys, you know, guys, I want to apprentice, and oh, I'll work for free. And you can just sort of tell, and it happened a few times in the early days where they just wanted to build themselves a guitar, and then they're gone. You never see them again. But Cindy had a different approach, and you know, she had an art background, and she really wanted to learn to be a guitar builder. And, uh, you know, being the fact that, you know, I grew up with three sisters, and my mom and my dad was very much, you know, you got to protect your sisters and you know, we've had a lot more respect for women i think than a lot of people do and so i just you know thought that this would work for me plus she was pretty easy to look at she's a 21 year 22 year old when she came to work here pretty young thing yeah so you know we'll we'll make this work you know? uh, she, just, she just picked it up so fast and and she's got so much talent Oh, that she's great. actually got her own line of guitars now and check her Instagram out. Cindy guitars, Cindy uh, guitars. Doesn't... All right. We'll definitely do that. Yeah. yeah. I have her own. Yeah. Cindy hey, Luna, her artwork in her wood burning, a pyrography, we call it. It's a type of wood burning that she does, but mm -hmm. her builds are uh, incredible too. She's actually doing them the same way as I taught her. Yeah, and she uses the same woods. We go out and get wood. She lives over in Flatbush in Brooklyn and we got wood from over there from a building that she found that was getting uh, torn down and it's exactly the same wood, which really blew my mind actually to think that every borough in New York city is built from this same wood. Wow. And then I had realized that New York city has the largest depository of old growth timber in the world right here in all these old buildings. We wow. have so much old growth wood here uh, and it, uh, it's just amazing that this stuff is so, thrown away they just throw it in dumpsters and in garbage trucks and you have to be there that day to get the wood or it's gone jeez who knows where it winds up probably in the in the ocean and winds up over in japan somewhere ha speaking of the ocean have you ever done any uh guitars out of the out of the pier wood no i haven't done any uh, uh, guitars out of pier wood before but uh, i've tried Lots of different, I know Fender was making wood from the Hollywood Bowl. They had some seats or something that they were making mm -hmm. chairs. And I thought that was interesting. And I just got approached by a uh, city winery. We have a city winery here, which is an incredible club. It's been really successful and they have all the major bands play there. And um, they, they just lost the rights to the building. They're going to be tearing the building uh. down. Walt Disney bought the, the ground and they're going to build oh, some monster ugly thing there. <laughs> Of course, but uh, they came in and had just heard about me and they saw a little clip on the trailer of the movie and they said, could you make a guitar for us out of the stage? And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Of course, this will be great because they're opening up a new city winery uptown. And so that guitar will be in there for guitarists to play and will be made from the stage from the old city winery. When I was watching the movie... I felt my blood pressure kind of like rise a little bit <laughs> twice, at least twice, because uh -huh. you were just talking about the building and uh, there, there were a couple instances in the movie where, uh, hey, the building next door is being sold. And I was like, oh, no, where's this going? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that was uh, that wasn't staged. That actually happened there. That happened, to, you know, during the filming, the sign went up on the building next to us that was for sale. Right. And these three houses here, these three buildings, this one and the two next to it are from the 1820s. They're the oldest on the block. They have the peak roofs and the little dormers up there. Mm -hmm. And um, that one came up for sale and real estate agent. And he did come in and that whole attitude I took towards him, I guess, when he was snooping around looking for square footage and stuff in this place. Yeah. It was all real. That was in the movie. It was a real thing. But I'm fortunate to have a great landlady who owns this building and lives upstairs and she raised her daughter here and wants to pass the building on to her in the future. And uh, they had been in here at the Angelus family for, for five generations in this building. So they want to wow. keep it intact and keep it uh, going. And, and she's pretty laid back and uh, she's kind of my age and we get along really good. We've been friends for 30 years now. 
the way you looked out there. Yeah, I sure did. I I mean, I was getting nervous when I saw that, when it cuts to the guy standing there, I'm like, he doesn't look like a guy who's supposed to be in that shop. What's about to (laughs) happen right now? Yeah, no. no, It was so real. And and that was exactly what happened. And Ryan just happened to be there with the, with the camera and, and that was all filmed and it was pretty much the way it happened. Wow. Yeah. What's uh, in the future for you right now? Uh, I mean, you just, is it the well, same I'm usually thing about or? a year yeah i'm usually about a year back ordered on guitars so i'm just you know coming to work i get in around 8 30 every morning between 8 and 8 30 and i'm here till at least six in the evening and you know i'm getting old too but uh i i just really love what i do it's not work for me and i get to get out of the city i'm a big cyclist and i love uh, cycling so i i get out of the city each week i ride about 100 miles up to upstate new york and uh get up into the country and breathe some clean air and try to clean my lungs out. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. That's outstanding. So the movie's coming out and um, everybody will be able to see it. I'm sure there's going to be quite a, a buzz and fanfare in the guitar world when that does uh, release. Um, and we'll do what yeah, we I can hope so. to I mean, add to there that. There isn't many uh, guitar movies, you know, that I, I've ever really seen. Now, maybe there are, but I just w- was amazed that while this movie was being filmed, I kept going, why would anybody want to see a movie about me? <laughs> I just didn't get it. But Ron did a, such a magical job on really creating the, the village, the Greenwich Village scene and, and the gentrification idea of what's been changing. And, the, 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 you know, walking in these doors is really like going back in time. You do yeah. kind of fall back into this space where... It's just like it was in the 1930s and the, the building, because it's from 1820s, has that feel about it. The old tin ceiling and the yellow pine floors and uh, it's smell of sawdust in the air. People are just so happy when they come in here. And speaking about blood pressure, I think the film will lower your blood pressure a little bit. You know, I, I, that's a that's a great point because I when Tony and I were talking about this and Jared, we were all kind of like, you know, that it, it kind of made me feel like, you know, when I was talking about restringing my guitars downstairs in my basement, it felt like that. There's just this pace. Uh, therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is right. Yeah. yeah. It's great. And then you hear your instrument with new strings on and nice fresh strings and you just want you to play some more new tunes and yeah. Strings are great that they do rusty and get need to be changed. I love that part of the guitar where you can change the strings and it all of a sudden it comes a little more alive again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something that, you know, we, we kind of hit on earlier, which is when people come in and they do make that connection with one of your instruments. And I think that that's what the film does such a great job of because it's not another film about like, let's just look at the craft. Yeah. Just the yeah. Craft. It's the connection. It's the yeah. person walking in who has no idea what they're about to put in their hands that can change their life, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And, uh, I thought and that was the a community really thing too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The community part of it, when Mark Rebo is talking about how all the kind of clubs are disappearing and it's nice to have a place that you can just guitar. And, and it's kind of, Ron always says, it's kind of like a post office. People will leave messages, you know, and they'll leave books for Jim Jarmers or some knowing that he'll eventually be back in here and <laughs> he'll have these things waiting for him. So right. it's kind of that way as well. Well, Rick, we sure do appreciate your time. This has been a real treat for us to talk to you about your love of making guitars and the history behind them. And we encourage everyone to go out and see. Would you just remind everybody the name of the movie? Yeah, it's called Carmine Street Guitars, and it's premiering here at the Film Forum. And I think it's going to be in at least 85 cities in the U.S. And it's been right now, it's been going to every film festival and people have been coming in from Reykjavik. Today, there was two people from Austria. Wow. People all over the world have seen it. And it's just, it's a magical thing for me to, to see that happen in my lifetime. And it's great. I hope everybody goes to see it. You'll definitely won't be disappointed. Ron did an incredible job and Jim and It's just a fun movie. That's fantastic. Well, we just got a few things that we're going to take care of, and then we're going to let you go. Um, one of our favorite segments on our show is called Would You Rather? Today's Would You Rather. <laughs> that was abbreviated. All right, yes. That's right. <laughs> Under the chase. Two days, Would You Rather? Uh, so you're going to have a guitar made out of some special wood and you have two choices. Is Rick going to build the guitar? I think he is. Okay. He definitely is. And he may even want this guitar. <laughs> and he's got <laughs> two. For so, so for this build for you, he's got two 
uh, very special pieces of wood, in which one piece of wood is from the Yankee Stadium. Whoa. The bench. That's mm-hmm. right. The bench. From the that, dugout. The, where the guys Whoa. sit on the bench and stuff. The bench Murderers warmers. Are up. Oh, where the guys spit their, their spit juice on it. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. would you rather have a guitar made from the famous ride Cyclone from the Coney Island? Coney Island. Yes. Ah, All well, right. That now, would be a hard choice. Th- well, you yep. think about that for a second. We're, we're going to let okay. your pipes take a rest. We're going to ask you, Tony, go. Well, I've always been more of a Dodgers fan, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Brooklyn, Dodgers, Dodgers, right? Brooklyn Dodgers, baby. <laughs> From the old days, huh? Yeah, I'm a Mets fan now, so <laughs> there yeah, you I, go. I, I relate to you. So, uh, and I do like roller coasters, so I'm going with the Cyclone. That's cool. Yeah, that, that's I like that. it. I think it'll play mm-hmm. faster, too. Yes. Yeah, and I think so. Just for everybody <laughs> that doesn't know what a Cyclone is, um, Rick, you know. You can tell oh, them about the Cyclone. Sure. Tell them about the yeah. Cyclone. Well, I went to on the cyclone. I think I was five years old. My grandfather took me there and we also went on the, they don't have, they didn't have them for many years after, but I think I was one of the last rides on the steeplechase, which actually were these horses that were on tracks and you would go around and grab a little. And I was sitting in front of my grandfather and I didn't know what the heck he was reaching for. But then I realized there were these little metal rings, which would give you a free ride. Uh-huh. Uh, brass uh, rings. Uh-huh. Yeah, brass rings. <laughs> but you never forget the cyclone. It was the <laughs> scariest thing for many, many years until you were a teenager. And then all you wanted to do is go back on the cyclone when you right. were a teenager. <laughs> and that was yeah. a big old, that was one of the first wooden roller coasters in yes. the country, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the uh, parachute jump, I actually remember being a, a teenager and having penny loafers and when you hit the bottom of the parachute jump, it would be on these big springs. And I actually <laughs> lost my loafers <laughs> when I hit the bottom. <laughs> oh, funny. Never forgot that. Oh, my God. Well, we're, since you're reminiscing down memory lane, which guitar would, are you going to choose, the Yankees bench or the Cyclone? Oh, Cyclone for sure. I'm a big Coney Island fan. Uh, if you ever read or saw the PBS special about Coney Island and, and back in and the Sigmund Freud would go there and analyze people because, you know, women weren't allowed to wear bathing suits. They had to wear things that covered their ankles and everything at the time. This is 1900, 1910, when Coney Island, they had three major parks there. And Luna Park was so lit up that you could see it 20 miles out to sea. Wow. It was a, they had elephants that lived there. They had 150 midgets that lived there. It was just an incredible, and still is to this day, it's all run down and beat up, but it's trying to make a comeback, but I have such fond memories of Coney Island and uh, the old wooden slide and the roulette wheel that would throw you out and so many dangerous things that you would never <laughs> be able to, you would never have them anymore. It was a great amusement park and still is. And you and who and who was watching? You cut out just a little bit. Who who would be doing that? Who would be doing what? You said that I think you said Sigmund. Oh, Sigmund Freud, yeah, would okay. actually go to, uh, and Dar- I, I think I heard Darwin actually to, to maybe even would, they would go to cultural place where people could really let their hair down and they weren't intimidated, you know, by being of the prudish society that Funny. the culture wanted you to be at that time. So it was really a, a place to open up and people were different. And there was, you know, New York City has everything from the, the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, we have everybody, the Polacks. I mean, everybody lives here and did live here then. It was a real melting pot, and Coney Island was the place to go. So, uh, Jer- Jared, how about you? I'm a huge baseball fan. Um, by default, since I married my wife, I'm a Cleveland uh, Tribe yeah. fan. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'll say it. Cleveland Indians. Yeah, <laughs> Cleveland, <laughs> Cleveland Tribe, yes. I know that's a controversial point. It is. Yeah. But uh, yeah. anyway, I love that team, so... Since I'm a big baseball ball fan, I I will go with the Yankee Stadium bench. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not a big Yankee fan, but yeah, give me a piece of that bench. I'll play it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I think I'll go for the bench too because just growing up as a kid and reading so many books on on the old the old Yankees and everything. I grew up yeah. on the West Coast, so that was like mm. that was just like a, a mythical. Well, the you know, Dodgers thing, followed right? you. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. We lost our Dodgers. Yeah. Um, so uh, Tony, once you uh, you got a couple, uh, you got to thank you. You know, I have a, I have a story about the Dodgers. Do you know how they got their name? Oh, I don't. I just heard this on NPR this weekend. So they got their name from uh, when uh, electric streetcars were first 
uh, introduced in Brooklyn yeah. and oh. people did not, you know, they, they were used to horse drawn carriages to and the horses, <laughs> yeah. the horses would stop. The horses would stop when a person crossed the, yes. the tracks or whatever. Oh. But, and, the trains but the trains didn't. <laughs> so yeah, people had to dodge, dodge, dodge the trains. Yeah, dodge the were dodging. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. There's a great night. 1906 actually it was right before the San Francisco earthquake. It was like a week before they say, and there's a film that somebody made. I th- I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. In fact, I did find it on YouTube where one of the trolley cars is going from one side of the city to the other. And you see everybody running in front of the trolley yes. car and getting out of the way and, and all the old buildings. And to think that two days later, the city collapsed with this giant earthquake and the fires burned it to the ground. Yeah, yeah. It's just an incredible, incredible video. Yeah. Um, man, oh man, this is, I'm just, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like it's fireside chat with, with Rick Kelly. It's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, anyhow, at this point in the show, we, there's a special group of people we like to thank. They are our executive producers Ooh. and they've gone over to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs and found out how they could become executive producers. That's right. Yep. And for a very small amount of donation, they get a great prize package. They get uh, T-shirts and barefoot buttons and picks and stickers and fun stuff, all kinds of things. But even mm-hmm. more importantly, Jared, what happens? They get their name right on the thing. And that is what I'm going to do right now. That's right. Bada boom. Thank you very much to the following executive producers, starting with Tom Barazin, Mommy. Martin Cliff, John Daly, Sean S. Chris Kearney, Darren Gregory. Doug Christ, Michael Van Zant, Brad Partridge, Corey Nigro, Ken Sayers, Jonathan Jerusik, Brian Robison, Michael Senchuk, Michael McVeigh, Rick Lenglou, <laughs> Stefan Lam, Johnny Knowles, Anthony Lanthrop, John Anglin, Tyler Bray, Tyg Harmon, Christopher Heidel and John Esterly. John Esterly. Hey, hey, thank you guys so much for helping to contribute to our show, for keeping our lights on and the internet barely working. And we are just so grateful for your listenership and for people dropping lines and let us letting us know that we're doing a good job or thank things you. that we can improve on. Uh, man, oh man. Um, Rick, I, 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 it's killing us because we all want to just give you a big, a big <laughs> handshake and a big hug right now. This is uh, such a great time fun. talking to uh, you, and uh, huge congratulations on the movie and the success of your shop and your the long run of your uh, love of building guitars. Oh, thank you, Matt, so much, and thanks for having me. Uh, just one extra thing: I, I do have these special knobs on my guitars that are handmade with a really high dome on them, and. Um, they're uh they come all, all you know on only on this guitar you'll never see another guitar knob like that interesting wow <laughs> well well I'm you'll intrigued. never see other guitar, <laughs> guitar knobs like us either yeah. so yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> three, we're three very yeah. unique knobs yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna go check the shop out one of these oh yeah, yeah. we gotta you ever, do it do you ever hear a knobbies do you ever see those knobs that was a short-lived company that made rubber knobs and they were awesome. I used to love those knobs. They're called knobbies. I don't huh. remember those. Yeah, I knob, K N O B E S E. Like they were easy to use. And they really did have a nice grip to them. I don't know what kind of rubber they used, but they, uh, I think they're still in business, but you have to buy a huge amount of them to get to be a dealer. Mm. And I just haven't, you know, done that. But they were always one of my favorite knobs, too. Oh, what a trip. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, where can we find each other? Uh, Rick, where can people find you? Carmine Street Guitars is located in New York City in Greenwich Village at 42 Carmine Street. And uh, it's uh, 42 Carmine Street, New York, New York, 100-14-212-691-8400 is the phone number. Come visit. All right. That's a lot of math. Hopefully everybody <laughs> remembers that. Uh, Tony, how about yourself? Oh, that's, if you need custom pickguard work, putting in different pickups, whatever you want to do, go over to pickguardian.com. Uh, and then you can also check out some of the projects I'm working on uh, on Instagram at pickguardian and the number one. And there's uh, always some things on Facebook, too. And if make you need, great, great pick guards. Great oh, well, thank you. <laughs> if you need uh, pickups, go to Jared at BrandonWomPickups.com to drop me a line and uh, check out my website, Brandon Wom Pickups. If you need some old looking new pickups 
or nice. new pickups, give me a call. There I can you make go. your dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can send me a note, Todd, at theguitarnobs.com or DM me on Instagram. We would love to hear what you think about the show. Share us your uh, would you rathers. And we, uh, we're we getting quite a, a fun list of them. We got some real good ones coming up. Huge, huge, huge thank you to Rick Kelly for uh, sharing his time. And uh, please go see the movie. Uh, if you love guitars, which you're obviously listening to our show, so you're going to love this movie so thank you so much rick for joining us oh thanks for having me and uh have a great guitar week everybody and subscribe yeah. Yeah. well that's it for these knobs please visit our patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs visit our website at the guitar knobs.com for all of our past episodes four on the floor blog and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also, be sure to check out our Instagram at Guitar Knobs. Catch you next time.